I'm glad to see you all visiting. It's great to be here. Um, we'd also, it's great that we have our company, our guest speaker today, Carrie O'Kay. And Bob Levinson. Many of you know Carrie O'Kay from uh, Wild Birds Unlimited. Uh, he was born in Hendersonville, spent time on Long John Mountain in the 50s and 60s, and traveled a bit, but retired back in Hendersonville. So we all can relate to that. Um, I'd like to let him speak to you now. Thank you, Gary. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This is such a beautiful time of the year, and spring is coming, and we, we are so excited. The leaves are coming out, and we have nine months of beautiful weather ahead of us. So um, uh, this is my favorite time of the year. I wanted to introduce you. This is my father-in-law, Bob Livingston. Bob's family is iconic to, uh, you know, to Hendersonville and Henderson County. They've been here uh, since the about 1902, and my family also came here in 1902. Now, part of the reason that I wanted, yeah, let me silence my phone and make sure it's all <laughs> Part of the reason that I wanted to come here and talk to all of you is I spent an inordinate amount of time on this mountain growing up. My, my home was on North Main Street, but my uncle had acquired this property from the McCarson family. My uncle's name was Forrest Vila Hunter. He went by the name of Foppy. He was a, an executive with the Northwestern Bank, which is located at 4th and Main Street. I don't know for sure if he acquired this out of uh, lack of payment of taxes by the McCarsons or not, but it wouldn't surprise me. So he owned the top of this mountain. And Whenever I could in the summer and spring, summer and fall, I would come up here almost every weekend and stay in the cabin that was located at, on the ridge of this mountain. I've been up here several times and have tried to identify exactly where the cabin was. If you can imagine, it was a one mile driveway up the mountain. It entered right where your gatehouse is, but it was just a gravel road. If you imagine when you come to the welcome sign where the road splits and you can take a right or a left, the road went up to the left and it pretty much followed exactly the road up, up the left. So, but it wasn't two lane and it wasn't paved and it would wash out from time to time and you had to be careful about which vehicle you were using to get up there. Usually how I got up there was to walk. I would finish playing baseball at a baseball game and my mother would drop me off at the bottom of the hill. And she would go home on North Main Street and I would, I would hike up the hill. If you can imagine after you make that left on, onto, I think it's called the Carriage Parkway, mm -hmm. is that? Back, back, back. Yes. You would go up about, I would say 300 yards. And on the left, on the left was a cemetery. And this was the McCarson Cemetery. It actually, it was kind of spooky. <laughs> Because when you would walk through that cemetery in the daylight, you, you would see that there were concave areas where the casket had dissolved and the ground had 
and just made a concave area where it had decomposed. So I didn't hang around that cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> but what was what what was interesting? Well, when I would sometimes when I would be dropped off, it was almost sunset. So here I am by myself walking up to the cabin because my dad was already up there or friends were already up there. I get up to the cemetery. And then I would run. <laughs> now, this cemetery has been moved. It still has the McCarsons on it, and it is located at Creekside. If you drive into Creekside and take a right and keep taking a right, you'll You'll come upon a small forest area on the right, and there's a handrail with some granite steps, and those lead up to the old Carson Cemetery. I'm not sure exactly what year that was relocated. It was probably about the time the carriage park was established, because part of the widening of the road probably took part of the cemetery out. So. The Carsons are still there. Now, I remember when we, the cabin, well, let me, let me back up a minute. As, you, as you're coming up the road, this one mile long road, you first encounter the cemetery on your left. You keep going another 300, 400 yards, and you encounter the quarry on the right. Yeah. The quarry was there. There were peach tree. There were two peach trees out in that quarry, and they had tiny peaches, but they were delicious. You would then continue up the same road, Carriage Parkway, until you got to the ridge. I had to jot this down because I tried to drive that road this morning. And once you get to the ridge, take Croydon. C R O Y D O M. And you take a right on Croydon, and that's where the road to, uh, would take you. It would follow the ridge for the le next half mile. So you follow the ridge, and it just is a little up and down, but it's not anything steep. It's, you're right on the very ridge until you get to about where the tennis courts are. And that's where the cabin was. The cabin was a, a long cabin, and it was a two-room. There was a living room and a kitchen. And in the living room was a big fireplace that kept you warm. And in the kitchen, there was a wood-burning stove, which we never used, because if you open the stove up, there were mice and rats you know, <laughs> in there. We never used it. We always would just use a Coleman, a Coleman um, propane, propane uh, sort of cooktop. <coughs> in the living room, there we had three cots. The cots were about the width of the table over here, but shorter, and they were tucked against the walls. The three, the three cots were. And there was a dividing wall in the long cabin between the living room and the, and the kitchen. And it was still similar log cabin. And you know what chinking is in a, in a log cabin? It's usually lime and straw that is mixed together and they will, they will they will put it between the joints of the log. Well, there was chinking in that cabin, and etched into the chinking, 1856. Wow. So I always rem I always remember laying there, and I was going. I could see the chinking right right there in the etching. I was going 1856. Well, I was up here and. 1956, in the 1950s and 1960s, but I was, I was thinking, oh my, what has happened here over the last hundred years? 
to it now 150 years. So the cabin was beautiful, but it was primitive. We had no plumbing. Most of the time, we didn't even have an outhouse. I remember an outhouse, but I think when it fell in, nobody cared. <laughs> we did have water, though. We had water, and it was the most exciting way to get water. You would walk out on the porch. It was a covered porch. And there was what we called the Lazy Susan. Coming from, coming from the house porch, running at l about a quarter of a mile, were two high-tension you know, high wires. And on these wires was a little trolley. And it had a hook on the bottom of the trolley. This went all the way down to the natural spring which is probably underneath the lake that is here. So imagine if the house is roughly, the cabin is roughly where the tennis courts are. Imagine a wire going down a quarter of a mile down into what is now the lake to a natural spring. So we would come out and you would take the bucket. The bucket was a tall, sli tall, slender bucket. Mouth about like that, bottom about half that size, but it, it stood up about 18 inches. And you would hook this bucket on to the hook. You would take the brake off of the, the winding wheel and let her run. <laughs> and she would, she would run, it would take about a couple of minutes to get to the bottom and crash into the spring. So you would wait about two minutes and then crank like hell. <laughs> it was you would crank and crank and crank. It, I I used to have this. Um, I would count and I I was trying to remember how many times I would crank. I mean, but it had, it was in the hundreds to get the water back up there. The water was fantastic. The water was probably at 35 degrees, delicious in the middle of in the middle of the summer. Uh, I mean it, it, it was just precious. So there were there were so many things that we would do and you would make fun for yourselves. You know, just being on this acreage. Uncle Foppy had a tractor up here, and he also had a, a sickle where you would hook it up to the back of the tractor. Someone would drive the tractor. You, as a little 10-year-old, would sit on this little metal seat, and you would have these arms that would drop down on either side. You would engage the lever for the sickle to cut, and you would mow the field up there. The field was the field and orchard around the cabin was probably four or five acres, and we had to do that, you know, maybe once a month. But I, I, I think about that: a ten-year-old child sitting on a metal seat that bounces like this with all these scissors that are going back and forth, OSHA would have a heyday. But we all survived and we all have our fingers. So. Buffy also had an old WW2 Jeep. It was a yellow, orangish uh, Jeep had bullet holes all over it, <laughs> had no brakes. <laughs> so as a 10-year-old or 12-year-old, you know, I was able to drive it. I learned how to downshift very quickly <laughs> because that, that was our brakes. You know, and I always had a bailout. You know, as I'm driving along, you know, I'm, 
I'm driving along and the steering wheel's probably up here. I'm looking underneath it. <laughs> but I always had a bailout area. We would drive these little dirt roads that were all over the top of this mountain. And sometimes you'd make a little dip and go down into an area. Well, when I went, was on that dip, I knew that the car was, the Jeep was going to accelerate. So I needed to know, all right, I get it. I can, I could get it down into maybe second and never get it in the first. Mm -hmm. But I always knew that when I hit the bottom of that hill where the creek was, I had to go back up and I could run into the woods until I stopped. <laughs> so I, I knew where the big trees were and I knew that I could run over the saplings and, and it would help to break, break them. <laughs> so one day, one day I was on the, on the porch, and I looked out, and I saw this, I saw this man that I'd seen before, and I, I said, Dad, who's that man on the white mare up there? And he said, uh, that's Long John McCarson. It wasn't Long John, it was Long John's grandson. Long John goes back to the 1700s. But John McCarson was born about 1890, and he's also buried down at that cemetery that I was talking to you about. Well, reportedly, Long John was six foot seven. You know, so who, who knows? I know that this man that was sitting on top of that mare, he was a huge man. And I would see him from time to time just roaming the, the hilltop on his horse. He, he was just enjoying the ride. My sister actually uh, was asked by the McCarsons to, we need to exercise our horses. Would you come out and ride them from time to time? And they, Georgia, my sister, and a friend of hers would do that. So... Fafi, Fafi had this, had that cabin, and he decided to, I, I don't know if he had actually sold that property, but he also had another cabin, it's called the Lake Cabin. And it's the, Andrew Riddle now owns that property. It's a small lake, about one acre in size. It's all private property, so I, I don't suggest that you go up there, but I have. And uh, it's at the end of Essex. If you're driving out 191, about, about a half a mile before you get to Carriage Park, on the left is a sign that says Essex. If you follow that road in, it will take you to the lake where Uncle Foppy's other cabin was. <coughs> Back about 1970, Foppy tore down the cabin that was up here on, on your property. And he had it reassembled over at the lake. Subsequently, he has Andrew Riddle has expanded that, and the old cabin is still there, but it's been incorporated within the inside of his new house. Wow. And it's, it's very charming. And uh, maybe, and maybe if you contacted Andrew, he would be happy to have you tour up there. But I, I, I can't speak for him about that. So before I before I move on talking about jump off, I want to talk about growing up in Hendersonville. That's part of the reason that I bought I brought Bob here with me. You know, Bob was born in 1930. I was born in 1950. We both grew up here, and we both had incredible incredible history. His history is probably more startling than mine uh, because Bob's 
family is the Livingstons. Philip Livingston signed the Declaration of Independence. Bob is a direct descendant. Um, his family moved here. His father came up from, well, his father was out of Char Charleston. His mother, his mother came out of Miami where they were in the tomato uh, plantation. Foundry business. Foundry business. Foundry business. And so they came up here in about 1902. His grandfather was J.K. Livingston. His father was Buster Livingston. And they, those two were the promoters of the music era of the 1920s and the 1930s. Heavily, that was part of the, the wonder of, of this community. At one point, Hendersonville was considered the dancingest city in the United States. And a lot of it had to do with the people that the Livingstons brought here. My mother was born in 1916, and she did, she, she used to do these talks like this and talk about growing up in Hendersonville, and she's written, she wrote several articles, and she called Bob's dad back when she was writing an article back in the 1970s and said, Buster, tell me all the people that, were, that you brought in for these concerts. The concerts were at the Pavilion at Laurel Park. They were at the Flack Hotel out in Edneyville. They were at the Pavilion at uh, Osceola Lake. They were at the tobacco warehouse between Asheville and Hendersonville. Well, these are cheap. My mother spoke with both Buster and Frank Todd, who owned the brick plant. And these are some of the people that were brought into Hendersonville on the musical tour every summer. Ella Fitzgerald, Glenn Miller, Jan Garber, Tommy Dorsey, Chick Webb, Benny Goodman, Chef Fields, Jelly Leftwich, Cab Calloway, Fats Waller, Louis Armstrong, Guy Lombardo. In addition, JK's, I guess it was one of JK's sons, was James Livingston his son? Yeah. Okay, and he also went by the, the moniker to, Toots. Or was it Toots or Fudd? They were cousins. They were cousins. <laughs> if you see, if you see the movie, the latest edition of The Great Gatsby, and you hear that twangy twenties music in the background, some of that music is Toots and Fuds. So they were very highly pub published at the time. So, Bob, would you like to talk about some of the? Um, 20s and 30s, I know you weren't here. Okay. Well, well, it's uh, ready to go. Can you hear me? Yeah. You yeah. uh, mentioned the dancing part. Uh, when I was about eight years old, closer, please. Closer. Mrs. Fulker's ballroom dancing class every Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> I think I went from I was eight to thirteen, and she finally called my parents up and says, "There's no hope." <laughs> so that was my part of the dancing. I was born in 1929 on Fifth Avenue in Bly Street, Hendersonville. Uh, grew up later at. Uh, uh, 1015 North Main and in the later years lived in Laurel Park. The 
I guess I was about eight years old. My family sent me up to visit an aunt and uncle in Cincinnati. And I came back and I realized, man, I've been to Coney Island, uh, the Cincinnati Reds, <coughs> trolley cars, cable cars. We don't have any of that in Hendersonville. <laughs> <laughs> this is after Kerry called me last night. And then it dawned on me, we did have. We had a lot of things, they were just different. Uh, the main thing I think about every Saturday would be the movies. There used to be two theaters on Main Street. The old Fox Theater was between 4th and 5th on the east side of the street. It's about where... Uh, Ru Rudy's. Yeah, about right there. <clears throat> you could go on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock for a dime. They had probably three chapter pictures, three cartoons, a uh, ongoing chapter picture, and a cowboy movie. <laughs> <laughs> you could get in, people would actually smuggle bread and peanut butter in the <laughs> middle of the depression. We stay there, especially if it was raining, we might stay there till 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> and everybody walked to get there and walked home. So that was the main, main thing of Hendersonville, the Fox Theater. And occasionally it was really big news they would bring a movie star to town like Lash LaRue. <laughs> he would stand on the stage with a bull whip and take a cigarette out of someone's mouth. <laughs> I, I never volunteered for that. <laughs> but, the other big events on Saturdays, especially after Christmas, it would be freezing cold. But every Saturday, there were only two schools in town, let me tell you that first. And uh, there was one on 4th Avenue where the administrative building is now, and that was first through the seventh grade. Then the high school was eight through 12. When we would go to the movies on Saturdays, we had a colored friend that would go with us. This is going back, you know. He could not sit downstairs with us. But it was all right if we went upstairs and sat with him. I've never quite figured that one out, but that was a fact. So half the time we were in the balcony. Uh, that was just the way the town was in those years up until World War One, and World War Two. The other main event would be airplanes, believe it or not. On a given Sunday, a tri-motor Ford would come to Hendersonville out at Oscars Airport, the one out by Blue Ridge Community College. And for five hours, I think it held 14 people. It would take off, fly down Main Street, fly around Stony Mountain, fly back down Main Street, and land. And in the given day, it could be 200 people flying that thing. I mean, it might be 100 people waiting in line to get on. <laughs> then the next thing, the fellow that owned the airport, if he bought a new airplane, that, man, that was big all over town. That, uh, there was nothing much to talk about. And he would do the same thing fly it around Stony Mountain and fly it back down Main Street. <laughs> the other big airplane event we had, we had a couple in town called Press and Sadie Penn. And they did not have any children, they had a nephew, Preston Patton Bender. And he had graduated from the Citadel and was in the Army Air Corps. Well, on a given Saturday, and it was the jet of the ages then, the old AT-6. He would come home for a weekend, and he would come down Main Street, and of course, you know, we thought he was right on the building top, and he was up and up, but it would just wake the whole town up. And down Main Street, do a loop, and turn around and clock that afternoon. 
There would be one fellow leaving with a sack of marbles. He, he, he couldn't care. <laughs> and, and the favorite of them all, I don't know if any of you knew Bill Ward, who uh, ran the country club, Hendersonville Country Club, until about 2000, I guess. He, uh, he would pick you like a chick. I mean, you could almost count on it. You know, on Saturday, somebody's going to have to help you carry the marbles. So. I might throw in, in later years, he, uh, he also devoted that to the hot spot pool room and uh, owned about everybody in town that wanted to pick up a Q-stick. <laughs> Those are just some of the events I think of to start with. The dancing part would be on Main Street on Monday night between, I guess it would be Fifth Avenue and Third Avenue. They would block it off. And there would be a street dance every Monday night from June through August. It would draw, I don't know how many, but the town would just be packed with people. And then the other square dance of the week would be at Flax Hotel out of Edmonton. So between those two events and then occasionally when the big band comes down. I, I remember, I guess I was 10 or 11 and firmly convinced, I don't know if any of you remember Helen O'Connell and Bob Everly that sang with the Jimmy Dorsey band. In my mind, she had to be the best looking human being that ever lived. <laughs> they played at the high school. And of course, they didn't let me go. But afterwards, before the band left town, they came by my mother and dad's house, and I had a pop or two, I believe. And anyway, from my upstairs bathroom, I could see Helen O'Connell in the kitchen. <laughs> and, uh, the next week in school, I was totally obnoxious. <laughs> uh, none of it's the truth, but boy, it sounded good. <laughs> and, uh, we, we would generally have someone, in, we had a fellow in the class, Billy Booty, who became an authority on the movies. He, he, he could tell you he saw our mayor, Mayor Edwards, who was mayor of Hendersonville, I think for 36 years, and, and uh, several other people from World War One, and they would show old clips or something and show troops marching in World War One, and of course, he absolutely knew that that's Mayor Edwards and that's John Smith, that's Turk Rubenstein. Of course, he didn't know any of them. He said that every week. <laughs> it, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but I, his favorite thing was <laughs> he was determined to see a horse ex going to the, the bathroom, I say, in the movies. <laughs> Never found one. He would basically sit on about the third row and look. <laughs> but it was just a, a pleasant easy going town and uh, you could get anywhere you wanted to go, you walked. Uh, a friend of mine, I, when Carrie drove me up here, I, this is the first time I've been up here. I'm just utterly amazed at it. We used to come out here and squirrel and a friend of mine in town, Bob Redden, uh, was convinced there was a lake somewhere that was covered up with ducks. And I remember we got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, came out of here, stayed till about 10. I don't even think we saw a sparrow. <laughs> you didn't get all the squirrels, by the <laughs> no, no, we sure did not. <clears throat> the other part I'd like to mention is the, uh, the, the high school. The old rock part of high school, Mr. Prince, an attorney in town, got the WPA to come here and build that high school. The one that was 
where that one is now was a wooden one. And they moved it from there out Ninth Avenue is where the college school was prior to 52 or 4 or something like that. And, uh, but <clears throat> as I got older and some of the bands were here, my friends and I would, we, we couldn't get in, but we could stay outside and listen. <laughs> so that was also a big night out. We'd get to walk and listen to the bands outside. <laughs> But the war just changed dramatically. I mean, not the war, but the town during World War II. Believe it or not, we got every Thursday, we did uh, war relief, we call it. Uh, I remember from uh, about the seventh grade on, we had a wagon. Uh, I was part of a group, went house to house and picked up grease. Others picked up paper. We took them all down to First Avenue and turned them in. <coughs> Basically, the whole school would do that. Uh, after the war, uh, North Carolina put in 12 years of high school education. So a lot of the veterans had left there. And at 17, only had 11 years. <coughs> so. Most of them, if they were going to Chapel Hill, so the, at least in North Carolina, had to get a 12th year education. So you had veterans in school with 15, 16 year olds. Uh, another big, big event for us was uh, Friday afternoon football. It seemed like the whole town showed up. Uh, there weren't any lights, but uh, the football did not start till September. We go September to almost Thanksgiving. But again, it was those days. I really think the crowds were just as big then as they are today. We just pack them in. And if you play out of town, the company, the Odell's had a, <clears throat> in the furniture business, they had a delivery truck. So if we were playing in Canton, if you could come up with a quarter, he, he would get as many as 25 or 30 people in the back of the delivery truck <laughs> and drive us to Canton. And with him, when the game was over, he left. <laughs> Had no idea who he took. <laughs> so if you weren't in the van, you were in Canton. <laughs> And he did this for three or four years, I did. <laughs> and then, about that time, I went off to school, the military, and came back, and the town has changed, and uh, all for the best, I guess. But those were good and happy days, and I hope I at least reminded you of some of the things that were important to all of us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we are very, very lucky. I, I particularly am very lucky. And the luckiest part of the luckiest thing that ever happened to me is when I married his daughter. <laughs> Some of you may know that I'm also the mayor of Laurel Park. And like Bob, I just love history. And there is so much history that's connected between Hendersonville and Laurel Park. Back in the 1920s, Laurel Park was referred to as the town that made Hendersonville famous. <laughs> Bob mentioned about entertainment and seeing uh, all, all the trains when he went up to Cincinnati. And we had a train that ran down Fifth Avenue. And it stopped at the Hunter Building, which is at the corner of Main and Fifth Avenue. And the Hunter Building was my grandmother's home, uh, building. 
if you know where the Penny Insurance Building is on Sixth Avenue, Sixth Avenue, that was the house that I was born in. That was my grandmother's house. Um, and when they moved up here in 1902, uh, they came out of Alabama because of uh, malaria. My grandfather had had malaria, and the climate up here just felt better <coughs> to him. So they moved from Montgomery, Alabama, where they sold their, he sold his pharmacy and built a new pharmacy. It was a Hunter Pharmacy. Um, in that building, the Hunter Building. So right at that intersection was a train, and the train ran all the way out Fifth Avenue until it got to Laurel Park. It looped up, it went up a, a gradual grade, looped around Rainbow Lake, came back across Laurel Park Highway, and went to Rhododendron Lake, which back then we just called it Laurel Park Lake. It was the water venue of Hendersonville. I learned how to swim in that lake. I used to teach life-saving in that lake. I would dive off the tower, and you, when you, it, there was a two-story tower in the middle of the lake, and when you dove into about 12 feet of water, the last two feet was covered with leaves. <laughs> and you would do a flip, and push off the bottom and the leaves would squish between your toes and you'd get them off the <laughs> But it was a it was it was quite a ven it was quite a venue. That rail line was called the dummy line because it could only go in one direction. So it would it would leave Fifth Avenue, go out to Laurel Park. The whole the whole ride would have been about two miles. But then it would back up and go back down, all the way back to Main Street. So there was a there was an instrumental man that was also part. He was the mayor of Hendersonville. He helped establish Laurel Park. His name his name was W. A. Smith. W. A. Smith is probably the most recognized iconic figure in Henderson County through the through the ages. He did so many things to help promote Hendersonville but also to promote Laurel Park. Laurel Park in the 1920s was covered with little tiny lots. They were they were like an eighth of an acre. You could not build on these lots. But during the speculation period in the 1920s, a lot would sell for $100 for a lot. And two, two months later, it was selling for $30,000. So people were flipping, flipping, flipping. They would flip the lot one week, two weeks later, it would flip again. And that was part of W.A. Smith's, that's probably not the best part, but you know, that, that was part, part of what he was doing. He was, he created a four mile road all the way up to jump off. It was built out of concrete. It was lit, it was the first lit highway in the United States. And at one point he was building a 15 story, 14 story hotel. Imagine being on this ridge and looking back over a jump off mountain and you're seeing a 15 story hotel. I don't think it would be appropriate. So, what happened though is that uh, what part of the financing was out of the Flagler's, the Flagler Hotel in Jacksonville. They were building a rail line, the Flagler's were building a rail line down to the key. And in 1926, there was a big hurricane. And if you've read, uh, there's one book it's called Hemingway's Hurricane. It's about that disaster. Hurricanes were not named at that time. 
the only reason that Hemingway got his name onto it was because he was in Cuba and he came over on his yacht to see what he could do to help. Well, when this happened and the disaster took place at Marathon Key, it affected Laurel Park tremendously because all of a sudden, in 1926, it took us into an early depression. So our depression started in 1926, not 1929. So in 1926, in order to promote property, W.A. Smith, well, W.A. Smith died in about 1910, but his son, Walter B. Smith, or, yeah, I think that's right, Walter B. Smith wanted to promote the property, so he got in touch with Jack Dempsey, the heavyweight champion of the world. So, Jack Dempsey came up to Laurel Park and trained for one month in August, no, in April of 1926. There were a couple of venues where he would box, and one of them was Laurel Park Lake, another one was Poplar Lodge, and he would, you know, he would box and spar and train. Jack Dempsey was paid $30,000 for to be here for one month in 1926 dollars. Plus, he was given a house to live in, a Pierce Arrow to drive. So, it was it's amazing and staggering the amount of money that was spent to promote Laurel Park. Jack Dempsey then, in September of that same year, went on to fight what would, he would, he fought Jack Tunney in what was called the Long Count. And it was called the Long Count because after Jack Dempsey knocked Gene Tunney to the mat, he, went, he did not go to a neutral corner, so the count didn't start. Later on in the fight, the decision went to Jack Tunney, and Jack Dempsey lost his heavyweight title belt after holding it for, I believe it was about 12 or 15 years. So there have been so many things some that have taken place. Hendersonville really excelled in, I believe it was 1889, when the rail line was extended up from Greenville, Spartanburg, actually from Spartanburg area. When my grandmother came up here from Montgomery, Alabama, they took a train to Spartanburg, and even though the train was already functioning up the saloon grade, they took a wagon, out and they carried all of their goods furniture that they were bringing from Alabama in a wagon in 1902. We mentioned, you know, some of the other venues, the Black Hotel. Uh, there were, there was a hotel recreation, which... Yeah, no, the Beehive Inn is still there. The, the Beehive Inn and the Recreation Hotel, which his family ran, you, the Livingstons ran the hotel recreation. They also ran the Weeping Willow Pool, which was downtown, uh, at the corner is where the American Legion is now. So are there any are there any questions? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna jump over to and talk about Wild Birds Unlimited just for a second. Uh, but before I do, are there any questions that you might have for Bob or me? 
The cabin that you refer to, that you used to come up to, is that the cabin that Long John actually built? It, it is. Oh. It was probably their homestead. It's interesting, There's they also, the McCarsons also, maybe it's a different McCarson, they also had a homestead on top of Jump Off Mountain. There is still a cabin up there as well. And it's in it's an original location, but it is on private property. As you're going up the back parkway, the carriage parkway, on the other side of the guardrail after about that 300 yard point, there seems to be a single track road, a single track lane. Are you familiar with that at all? I am not. I, I, I don't remember that. I do remember walking up here. I've seen rough. I've seen ruffled grouse three times in my life, and one of them was up here. I don't know if anyone has seen ruffled grouse up up here, but um, I, I have seen them here. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Do you know anything about the operation of the quarry around what time that would have been? There were quarries all over. There was a quarry on Stony Mountain. Stone Mountain. Is it Stony or Stone? Stony. There was a quarry in Laurel Park where W.A. Smith actually carved out, he, he would mine out the curb stones that are in the city of Hendersonville. He also had the very first water source for the city of Hendersonville in 19. In 1889, there's what we call the reservoir. It's about halfway up the mountain. And there was a bond issue, and they, they uh, connected that reservoir to downtown Hendersonville using wooden pipe. So there was slats of wood to create a circle, and it fed the water system of Hendersonville for about one year. <laughs> that was all. They they uh, they didn't anticipate the usage, so they had to get. It wasn't enough water on on uh, in Laurel Park. Do you remember um, other source? You know the the sources for the quarry. No, uh, <laughs> the one in Laurel. I, I know the one in Laurel Park. Of course, the one in Fletcher, but I I don't know the others. So it was a it, it was a good way of making uh, for W. A. Smith to parlay a business. Uh, he had a crusher in Laurel Park, and he used that stone for the ballast for the rail lines that were being built, including the rail line between Hendersonville and Brevard, uh, and. Uh, Granite that was used on the gymnasium at the high school, the old gymnasium. Judson College. <clears throat> Judson College. And Judson College, yes. Judson College was located at, a, at about uh, Second and Justice. And it, during the, about the Civil War, it was on, I think when You've seen this historic marker out on Highway 64 out towards Walmart. Mm -hmm. The, uh, in about Stoneman's Raid. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that actually took place a few days after uh, Lee's surrender. But everyone didn't know that the war, or that portion of the war was over. General Johnston was still fighting down in Raleigh area and running away from General Sherman. And that surrender had not taken place yet. Well, the, the uh, northern soldiers actually camped at uh, Judson College. Probably because there were women there. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions before? Yes, sir. When was this last logged over? Do you remember when? when the last logging would have occurred here on this mountain? I, I don't know. 
I left in 1968 and didn't come back until 05. I know that Bombay never logged this mountain. Okay. Uh, I, I really don't know. Any other questions? Yes, yes, ma'am. Do you know if Carriage Park was ever a farm? Because when I bought my property, they told me that the cisterns, cement cisterns that are in the gully below my house, had been used for agriculture. And one of the fellows that worked on my house had camped up here as a Boy Scout in his youth and said that that's where they got their water from when they used to hike and camp this year. I do know that we had a couple of jamborees up here. And the, jam the Boy Scout jamborees, it's just uh, not the nationwide, but we would have some of the regional jamborees. And we would have uh, next near the cabin, we had, there was an orchard, and we probably had eight or ten apple trees in that orchard. That orchard, the clearing area was maybe four, maybe four or five acres, and that's where we would camp when we would have a jamboree. The water source that we used at that point back in the 50s and 60s was the spring that I mentioned to you. But all in that spring area, the, the water would weep out of the wall of rock. And so when the bucket would crash into that wall, the bucket was still about five feet above the ground. But the, the, the sheer wall, it was just kind of dripping water as a natural spring. Now that whole area down at the bottom where that spring was, was marshy. And it, it, I would say probably three or four acres of marsh, wetlands. There were turtles galore. Uh, they were all over down there, down there at the bottom part of the hill. A cistern that you're asking about the other portion of the property that Bobby did not own goes down into Hawthorne Hills. Yes. And Hawthorne Hills was actually what's called the Calmia Dairy. It was a dairy farm. And they had cows all through that dairy farm. I believe that Bert Browning owned that property and created Hawthorne Hills. Does that, does that sound right? Yeah, and we also had a uh, statewide ordinance that could only be one dairy in the county. Mm -hmm. and, and that was Calumia. <laughs> so, Calumia, Calumia, by the way, just stands for, you know, Calumia is the scientific name for Laurel, and rhododendron. Uh -huh. I, I know I didn't answer your question. I don't know where those cisterns were, but they may have been on that property. Well, I was told that they were in use in the 50s. So it very well could have been from one of the scout families that they were in use. Well, I was here that during that period, so I, I don't know. Yes, sir. I think we all appreciated uh, both of your talks, and it takes us older ones even back further than what you were speaking of. But if you drew the interest of any of the new residents here, I may suggest the first thing we did when we moved here, uh, going on eight years now, is we audited a class at Blue Ridge Community College on the history of Hendersonville and learning that Hendersonville was actually built on a bog and they started from the Civil War and worked all the way up. One of the things you're too young to remember, I guess, is you need to visit the county courthouse and see all the history and uh, different times of bringing photographs and all that. If you take the class at Blue Ridge Community College, it's not only in classroom, but on every Saturday when you're enrolled for that semester, you meet the professor 
and they drive you all around here and pick out spots. So you go to all the cemeteries you were speaking of. A lot of people here do not realize that at the recycle center, if you take your trash over there, there was a World War II POW camp. There was a state prison here. And right in the same area where you're the mayor of, on the French Broad, there was a steam paddle that went up to Brevard and came back. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Well, there's a lot to learn about Hendersonville. And there's a lot of interesting stuff. There's so much trivia in, in, in this town, wonderful trivia. Uh, if, uh, the King, King Street is named after, I'm trying to remember, he, was, he, he, he donated the land to, for Hendersonville. The Kings did. And they lived, that family lived in a house called Dunroy in Flat Rock. The Thompsons, Michael and Elaine Thompson, live in that house now. But it dates to the late 1700s. Uh, General King lived there. And General King was, was on MacArthur staff. So in WW2, when MacArthur exited Corregidor, he said, General King, you take the surrender. I'm leaving. <laughs> so General King, you know, was from here. He's buried at St. John's in the wilderness. Uh, he's had, you know, he had General Marshall, Truman, Roosevelt, all of these people visited him there at Dunroy. So the trivia, you know, Charleston, you know, Flat Rock was the uh, summer resort for Charleston. That's part of the reason the Livingstons came up here. You know, part of that family, the John Ash, lived on the Battery in what is probably the most iconic building on the Battery. It's the only one that has a a widow's watch or a cupola. Um, that was part of his family. Other questions? All right. I want to thank you for allowing us to be here. I wanted to say something about I have a parting I have a parting gift for every family. There's a coupon and a small bag of free, free seed for your birds. There's only one box here, but my, my truck is parked outside and I have about 80 uh, other bags. So there's enough for every family. The, this is a time of the year that is so special. I'll just give you a little bit of tidbits about birding and what's going on. Carrie, you know, I want to tell them one thing about the, uh, about the POWs who were here in World War II. We grew all of this bottom land through Mills River. We grew green beans back in those days, that, or Glad Hills. But, the primary crop in the whole county was green beans. In the first year, it was all covered up with green beans and needed them for the war effort. There wasn't anybody here to pick them. So they went to the local schools. I, I was one of them, and they were going to pay you 10 cents a hamper to pick them. I immediately assumed I could pick six an hour or something. <laughs> I think after an hour and a half, and I had one about half full, <laughs> they, they gave up on local help. <laughs> and the next summer, they brought all of the POWs they got from Rommel's Africa Corps here. Wow. And they spent the summer right out in Mills River. Huh. But <laughs> the unique part, in the afternoon, they would park on Main Street and let them all out. 
They go to the economy drug store, uh, the dime stores on Main Street. They were just all over Main Street for a couple of hours, and then they'd round them up and bring them back. And on Saturday afternoons, they'd get band concerts. So they really added to the community during World War II and got the binge big, by the way. <laughs> That same POW camp that you referred to was then became a county jail, or actually prison. prison. So that's, I don't, that's I don't that. know. I don't know if it's the same place or not, really. Okay. I, I think the POW camp, was, I think they tore it down when they left. Okay. It's located where the not maintenance sure. facility yeah. is up on the cut through. What is that? Stony Mountain Road. Stony Mountain Road. So, from a bird standpoint, we were very fortunate to be to live here. We have typically seasonal, year-round we will have 25 to 40 species year-round. Migrating, we will have 25 to 40 migrators that will come through the area. We, the most anyone has caught or seen in uh, Henderson County, it's about 120 different species. That's out of a total of about 400 in the United States. There are about three to 4,000 in the world. So we are very, very fortunate that we have such a unique location. The reason that it is, one of the reasons that it is so unique is that we are on the migration route down, up and down the Appalachian chain. If you go, if you drive up to Pisgah Parkway, you will see an entirely different set of species up there. The same thing, you'll see the entirely different set of species on the top of uh, Jump Off Rock. Than you will down in, say, Jackson Park. So we are very fortunate. Right now, it's the bluebird season. Bluebirds are the ones that nest first, and they will typically nest until July. They will have about four different broods. Bluebirds were almost extinct back in the late. 1960s, but a group recognized what was going on, and the reason for this was primarily DDT. And as a youth, I'm sure all of us can remember these fogging machines that would be driving down through a neighborhood, and you'd see all the all these kids running behind the fogging machines. My dad would look at me and say. Don't ever do that. <laughs> and he was right. I wish, I wish others had not done that also. But that was part of the reason that DDT, uh, well, that's one of the reasons that bluebirds almost were extinct. Now we have an abundance and they are gorgeous. So the other day, and I asked our salesperson, when do the hummingbirds come? And she, she said, April 14th. <laughs> and I was going, what? You know the exact date? You know the exact date? And sure enough, April 14th, they showed up. <laughs> so the scouts are probably already here. The scouts are the males, and they're looking for uh, a, a place to live. And they're very likely the same birds you had last year. They've traveled for 2,000 miles. These guys must have GPS systems on because I could not fly 2,000 miles to find my way back. So amazing, amazing animals. We're in an amazing, wonderful location. The, the weather is great. The season's ahead of us. So thank you for having both of us. And we're blessed to be here. So thank you.
Jesus, today we want to thank both of you for being here. It felt very much like family um, when I would sit around and listen to my family tell stories of who danced and which sister took the other one's dress and all that. And we loved Hendersonville before. Now we really feel like family here. Thank you. I'm Elaine Royer, and I put together the fact sheet that uh, you find on your table about Carriage Park. And I'm glad to know that about 95% of it is true. <laughs> I will have to be making some alterations probably, but at least you have some basic information. Uh, one thing that I did find out that the Main Street, you're going to have to tell me if this is so, was as wide as it is. It wasn't serpentine at that time, but it was for a four-horse team to turn around without backing up. And that's why it was so wide. Wow. So that's the one thing I can add. So again, thank you very much. This was my idea, not Harry, but there is a donation jar for the Audubon Society. As you go out the door, it's on the table with the um, main tags. Thank you very much. Well, please, please take a bag of the steam and the coupon, and I'll be by the back of my truck handing out four coupons, uh, four bags of seeds. So thank you.